the theme of telepathy is particularly appropriate because the Perrot Warwick Fund was set up in memory of Frederick Myers, a fellow of Trinity College, and one of the founders of the Society for Psychical Research in 1882. And it was Myers who coined the word telepathy. He was a Greek scholar. And, uh, of course, telepathy means tele, as in distant, as in television, telephone, and uh, feeling, as in empathy, sympathy. Um, so telepathy literally means distant feeling. In the early days of the Society for Psychical Research, one of the big issues was the survival of bodily death. And that was one of the topics Myers himself was very interested in. I think partly because telepathy was associated with this quest for evidence for survival, uh, the focus was on telepathy in human beings. Now, this made it more controversial than it needed being, because the people who opposed telepathy were people who saw themselves as heirs of Enlightenment rationalism, who saw uh, an opposition between what they thought of as the advance of science and reason, as opposed to uh, religion and superstition, which they thought were holding humanity back. Telepathy uh, got classified as superstition because so many people believe in it. Um, now, um, this meant that telepathy has always been controversial, uh, and um, it's always been something that uh, people who believe in a kind of materialist worldview feel that they need to oppose. Now, I'm going to talk this evening about the evolution of telepathy. My point is that it's not actually supernormal or supernatural, but that it's, or paranormal, it's natural, normal, and a part of animal nature. It occurs in many different uh, species of animals, and human telepathy is simply one aspect of a much more widespread phenomenon. I might say just one or two words about why I got interested in this subject. I was educated in a normal scientific way at school and at Cambridge, and um, I absorbed the standard scientific mindset, which involved, at least when I was being educated, atheism, materialism, and total skepticism to all psychic phenomena. This was just part of the standard issue mindset that people of my generation uh, grew up with, and still many young scientists today uh, follow that same way of thinking. So I thought telepathy was absolute rubbish, uh, that it couldn't possibly happen because the mind's nothing but the activity of the brain. It's all inside the head. And so telepathy must be rubbish. Therefore, all evidence for it must either be fraudulent or flawed. And there are many people who still think that today, of course. Um, but what stopped me thinking like that was an experience in Cambridge in the biochemistry department. One time in the tea room, uh, someone brought up the topic of telepathy, and along with several other research students, I said, oh, it's absolute rubbish, um, and said all the standard skeptical things. Um, but sitting nearby was uh, one of the older members of the department, Sir Rudolf Peters, previously professor of biochemistry at Oxford, who in his retirement was working in our lab here in Cambridge. And Sir Rudolf said to me, have you ever looked at the evidence for it? And I said, no, I don't need to. He said, well, I have, and he said, I think there might be something in it. And he then told me about an investigation he'd done. Um, a friend of his called E.G. Recordon was an ophthalmologist in Cambridge. He was treating a boy who was severely disabled, who was almost blind, and who was mentally retarded. And when he was doing standard eye tests, he was astonished that this boy uh, could actually read all the letters on the eye charts. And he knew he couldn't possibly read them, and at first he thought it was lucky guesswork. Then he thought maybe it was happening through the mother, and he asked the mother to leave the room, and the boy couldn't do it. He told Sir Rudolf Peters, and they set up some simple tests with the boy and the mother separated by a screen, and they showed her letters and numbers, and the boy immediately said what they were. They then set up an experiment over the telephone with the boy at home in Cambridge and the mother in Babraham in a laboratory six miles away, um, they showed uh, the, um, the mother cards, um, a random number of sequence of letters and uh, numbers, um, which were uh, pre-randomized. Uh, she looked at them, and uh, the boy would then say what she was looking at. With the letters, 
he should have been right one time in 26 on average, 3.8%. He was actually right 38% of the time in more than 100 trials. These were massively significant results. And Sir Rudolf Peters was convinced uh, that something was really going on. The only possible clues could have been by subtle sound clues. They had magicians listen to the tape to see if there was any fraud. I listened to them myself. And Peters convinced me that this research showed something was really going on. He was an honest man. He was uh, totally had no ax to grind. Um, and I was very impressed by the fact that here was a piece of research that showed something was really happening. When I discussed it with my colleagues, they reacted exactly as I'd reacted myself, saying, oh, it must be flawed. They weren't interested in looking at the evidence. And I realized this is a diagnostic feature of skepticism about psychic phenomena, uh, that, uh, an unwillingness to look at the evidence because of a firm belief it must be untrue. Well, I didn't drop everything and start working on telepathy because I was working on other things. I was working on plant morphogenesis. And in the course of my work on plant development uh, here in Cambridge and then later in India in an agricultural institute, um, I got interested in the concept of morphogenetic fields. Uh, this is a widespread concept within developmental biology. Uh, the idea was promoted princ principally here in Britain by C.H. Waddington, who was professor of genetics in Edinburgh. And it was the idea that living organisms are shaped by uh, invisible fields that mold the way they develop, and that these fields are needed to explain how development occurs in animals and plants. I won't go into the details of morphogenesis and its unsolved problems, but I got interested in these fields and I came to the conclusion there must be some new kind of field at work in living organisms that wasn't just the standard fields of physics, and wasn't just chemical diffusions. Um, I worked on the chemistry of the main plant hormone, auxin, and uh, I knew more than anyone, I think, at the time about plant uh, hormones that uh, affected plant development. And yet, it simply didn't answer, a chemical answer wasn't going to work, and it still hasn't worked. As I got interested in morphogenetic fields, I read Waddington's books and those of others. And uh, what, it, what they were part of was a holistic view of nature that can be represented here. Nature's organized in a series of nested hierarchies. The little circles could be subatomic particles in atoms, in molecules, in crystals, or they could be organelles in cells, in tissues, in organs. That everything in nature is organized in this nested hierarchy. At each level, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. Now, when it comes to social organization, the fields are uh, the organization of termite societies, of flocks of birds, of packs of wolves. Um, the, if if the, the three inner circles represent individual animals, the outer one could represent the whole social group. So uh, from this theory, I arrived at the idea social groups must have organizing fields. These must coordinate the individual members, even when they're at a distance. And then I realized that if that were the case, it could give rise to forms of communication at a distance, which would show up as telepathy. It seemed to follow from this theory. So I started looking at social animals, and uh, my aim was to see whether if telepathy existed, it was part of social organization in animals, and that it must have evolved uh, along with social groups. One kind of animal society are termites, and these, um, these, this uh, huge termite mound um, is constructed by millions of insects building elaborate architectural structures uh, coordinated in a way that no one, still, uh, no one yet understands. Part of it's by smell, part of it's by tapping sounds. It's not by sight because they're blind. And yet they can ma make these huge structures in a way that's uh, still not understood. In the 1920s, a South African biologist, Eugene Marais, found that if you damage termite mounds, they can repair them. And he put a steel plate into a damaged mound in such a way that there was no communication across it. And yet, on both sides, the termites built tunnels and arches that corresponded with those on the other side, as if there was an invisible blueprint. He thought that there must be a group soul in the termite colony. I would think of it as a field, a, a kind of morphogenetic field of archi animal architecture. Now, in flocks of birds, and here you see a flock of starlings over Brighton West Pier, 
Um, and here are some more uh, pictures of starlings. The entire flock moves in a coordinated way. The animals change direction without bumping into each other. Uh, they must anticipate where their neighbors are moving extremely fast. In the 80s, people modeled bird flocks uh, using a simple form of computer modeling based on nearest neighbor analysis. But that simply won't work. They do it too fast. And the best modern uh, computer models of flocks treat them as fields, uh, as if each bird is, as it were, a magnetic domain within a magnetic field, combined with the hydrodynamics of, of flow. Uh, and these models, which are field models, uh, give the best representations of flock behavior. These two, I think, are field phenomena. Uh, the kind of field they are is what I call a morphic field, a field that's concerned with form or shape. The same applies to schools of fish. They can change direction almost instantly when a predator approaches uh, and uh, move apart in what's called a flash expansion without bumping into each other. So they not only know where the others are, but they know where the others are going to go. So how is this coordinated? Nobody yet knows. And these were things that made me think that perhaps there are indeed features at work in social groups uh, which lead to forms of communication we don't yet understand, but which are part of biology. They're not supernatural, uh, they're not paranormal, they're normal. They're part of the ordinary coordination of animal groups. Now, the same should apply to animal groups like packs of wolves. When they're together, uh, of course, they can see each other and communicate by sound, sight, and all the normal senses. But when adult wolves uh, go hunting, they often range over hundreds of miles. Uh, they leave the young, the cubs, in the den with a babysitter. And the, um, the, the idea here would be that the field that joins them stretches uh, like a kind of invisible elastic band that continues to connect them at a distance and could be a channel for telepathic communication. This was a kind of rather vague, metaphoric theory. Uh, but what it did was made me look into the literature on wolves and wild animals. Um, and, of course, in recent years, there's been very little research. This is such a taboo topic that nobody within biology will touch it if they want to get a grant or a job. And, of course, most people want grants and jobs. So it's so taboo, it's so forbidden, that uh, despite a fascinating beginning to this field of research, uh, uh, by uh, William Long, uh, summarized in his book, How Animals Talk, first published in 1919. Uh, what he shows is that he tracked wolves for months in Canada, months on end, over many years. And he was convinced they were communicating at a distance without the neat use of sound. Of course, he knew they howled and so forth. But without howling, they could still tell not only what the others were doing, but where they were. And through tracking them, he could show how they were able to join up uh, over many miles, uh, suggesting an invisible form of communication. He found a similar thing in, in groups of birds when they were feeding apart from the rest of the flock. And he became convinced that animals in groups in the wild are te communicating telepathically with each other. And this is how they stay in touch. The only way the group can stay in touch at a distance would be by telepathy, when they're beyond the range of the senses. This would have survival value and would be part of their normal way of life. Incidentally, the wolf example reminds us that of a physical analogy. In physics, if two particles have been part of the same system and they move apart, uh, they can remain non-locally connected or entangled so that a change in one instantly affects the other. When Einstein realized this implication of quantum theory, he thought quantum theory must be wrong because it would allow for what he called a spooky action at a distance. Experiments show that quantum theory is right, Einstein was wrong, and quantum entanglement is now being applied in um, quantum computing and in quantum cryptography. Uh, there's a mysterious connection at a distance, uh, and it's not distance dependent. It's just as strong over a mile as over a centimeter. And it's particularly interesting because in telepathy that appears to be the case too. I'm not saying these phenomena are quantum entanglement. I'm saying that quantum entanglement provides us with an interesting analogy within physics. Well, all this is simply background, really, to the question of does telepathy really happen <coughs> in animals? And when I, uh, I decided to start working on this when I realized that uh, nobody had ever really addressed this question. After Long's book in 1919, there'd been virtually complete silence on this front. 
Um, a few amateur naturalists had explored the idea, but um, they knew if they wanted to get papers published in scientific journals, you shouldn't mention it. Um, so I decided to start looking at this by looking at the animals we know best, namely domesticated animals, dogs, cats, horses, parrots, and other animals that are, are widely known and, and, and known well to many people. I started appealing for information about anything people had noticed in their animals uh, that suggested powers that were currently unexplained. And I was soon deluged with letters and accounts from people who were only too willing to tell me about what their animals did. Now, some of my friends said you shouldn't pay any attention to what ordinary people tell you about their animals because they're just anecdotes. They're the product of wishful thinking and so forth. Um, but actually, most people who wrote to me seemed perfectly sensible. The anecdotes uh, were very interesting stories. And what's more, I got the same kinds of stories, hundreds and hundreds of them from all over the world. Um, so at least they added up to a kind of natural history of what people believed about their pets. And not necessarily uh, true, but certainly what people had observed or believed they would observed. For example, uh, we have more than 200 accounts from cat owners saying that their cat picks up their intention to take it to the vet and disappears. Cats hate going to vets. And um, what happens is that when the cat disappeared, people, uh, they couldn't find it. It would hide under a bed or in the garden if it could get out. Um, and after this happened a few times, people desperately tried not to let the cat know when they were planning to take it to the vet. They wouldn't get out the carrying basket. They wouldn't mention the word vet. Some people desperately tried not to think about the vet. I mustn't think about the vet. I mustn't <laughs> think about the vet. But still the cat knew and disappeared. Um, and some people, it happened so often and they were so desperate, they took to ringing up the vet from work so the cat couldn't overhear the conversation <laughs> and then swing by home on the way back uh, to take it to the vet still wasn't there. So we heard so many of these. Uh, the next stage in this research is to do surveys. How common is this? Uh, so we did a survey of all 65 veterinary clinics in the North London Yellow Pages. We asked them whether they ever had a problem with people missing appointments with their uh, cats. Uh, 64 out of 65 said, yes, it happens all the time. And the remaining one said, it happens so often we've given up the appointment system for cats. People just have to show up with their animals. <laughs> uh, one of the most testable of these claims of animals picking up their owners' intentions was with dogs and cats that know when their owners are coming home. I now have more than 1,000 cases of dogs doing this and 600 of cats doing it on my database. In most of these cases, the obvious explanations, like routine or hearing the car wheels crunching on the gravel outside the house, don't apply because they do it too long in advance and when people come home at non-routine times. Um, I discussed this with one of my oldest friends uh, uh, in the scientific world, Nicholas Humphrey, a previous holder of the Parrot Warwick Post. Um, and to my surprise, he didn't dispute the phenomenon. He's a, a fairly hardcore skeptic. Um, uh, to my surprise, he didn't dispute the phenomenon. What he said was, oh, well, my mother always knew when I was coming home to our house in Ashwell uh, because the dog would start waiting about half an hour in advance. And I said to him, well, Nick, well, surely that shows it couldn't be any of the normal senses. You know, the car couldn't possibly have heard you 20 miles away, the other side of Cambridge. He said, oh, on the contrary, it just shows what sharp hearing they've got. <laughs> um, well... Nick and I have spent many years arguing about these things, and we try and resolve our disputes by thinking of experiments. Um, and that's what gave me the idea for this research. Um, I said to him, what would happen if you came home by train and you cycled from Ashwell Station on a borrowed bicycle? So there were no familiar car sounds, oh, no familiar car sounds, no familiar sounds at all till you were almost home. And he said, oh, well, obviously the dog wouldn't know. And I said, well, perhaps it would. And that's the basis for the experiments I've done on a large scale now uh, with dogs uh, that know when their owners are coming home. Now, first of all, we did surveys to find out how common what this was, random household surveys in uh, Britain and in California. We rang up people at random. Uh, if they had pets, we then asked them about their animal behavior, the animal's behavior. About 50% of dog owners, on average, said their animals anticipated the return of an absent member of the family. On average, about 30% of cats. Um, 
Even in Los Angeles, where the cats seem to do far better than any British cats, or even cats in Santa Cruz, uh, they still didn't do as well as dogs. Um, now, does this mean cats are less sensitive? Well, I think it just means that many of them are less interested. Um, and um, uh, but those who do know um, do the same kind of thing as dogs, usually not quite as long in advance. But I also found this behavior happens with horses, with parrots, with tame minor birds, with, to some degree with ferrets, uh, pet rabbits, guinea pigs. With a few, I've got a few cases of lambs raised on the bottle and treated as pets <coughs> who do it, geese and chickens. Uh, so no, all of them are mammals or birds. I've, I, I've got very few convincing cases of reptiles doing this. I did try and find out if uh, pet reptiles did it, uh, lizards, snakes, and so on by uh, uh, appealing for information in the leading uh, reptile magazines, like Reptilian International. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, I've only got two or three cases and slightly questionable ones. So uh, it, uh, reptiles, on the whole, are solitary anyway, so they don't have strong social bonds with each other, so you wouldn't expect them to form them with people. Um, anyway, this is, seems to be, there's many, many reports, anecdotal reports, and I'm, I should be pretty sure that there'd be at least 20 people in this room who have or have had dogs or cats that do this. It's quite common. There's tens of thousands of cases in Cambridgeshire alone, I'm sure. Um, now, what do we make of this scientifically? Well, the great majority of people, my scientific friends who I discussed it with, showed no curiosity whatever. They just said, oh, well, it's obviously just routine, or the people at home give subtle cues, or uh, they must be hearing or smelling the people from a long distance away. The case studies showed that that was not an adequate explanation. Anyway, I started doing the experiments that I thought of in this conversation with Nick Humphrey. And um, what we found was that the do with dogs that do it fairly reliably, they could do it over and over and over again. Uh, start waiting, not just when the person uh, gets in the car to come home, but when they decide to come home. When we ask them to come home by taxi to avoid familiar car sounds, um, then the dog reacted when they rang for the taxi, not when they got into it. Uh, I set up a whole series of controlled experiments where people went at least five miles from home. Um, they came home in taxis at randomly chosen times. I chose the times at random. They didn't know them in advance. I rang them up. or No, I told them with a pager when to go home. Uh, and then we filmed the place the dog waited uh, continuously the whole time they were out. These films can be independently evaluated by third parties and give an objective record of the animal's behavior. Of course, they don't make very interesting viewing. Many, many hours of front doormats uh, with uh, the dog going there uh, usually quite a lot just before the person comes home. Anyway, these are some of the quantitative results uh, from the dog JT that I've worked with most. Um, the, the bottom axis shows 10-minute intervals after the owner went out. The, top, the uh, vertical axis shows the number of seconds the dog was at the window or door when she was out. And the final point, the filled-in circle, is the first 10 minutes of her homeward journey. As you see, the dog was at the door most in the first 10 minutes of the homeward journey. Uh, but it was already waiting there before she came home, uh, when she decided to come home, but before she'd actually, the car had actually started moving. Um, the dog did go to the window a little bit when she was out, uh, usually when you see it on the film, to bark at passing cats or to look at other dogs or to see people arriving in the street. It's clearly not waiting. But there were these occasional visits. But quantitatively, in these experiments, the time it was at the door for most of her absence, right up until the 10 minutes before she leaves, was about 4% of the time. And it was over 50% of the time when she was on the way home. It was highly significant, statistically. When this uh, um, was, uh, there was a report about this in the press, and immediately skeptics and skeptic organizations attacked the research, saying that it must be flawed, telepathy was impossible, I'd been duped by the dog owners who'd been communicating by secret phone calls and then activating the dog with high-pitched whistles that I couldn't hear, and I'd simply been taken in. Um, so I had, and I'd done the wrong kind of randomization, I'd used the wrong kind of taxi, and so forth. Um, <laughs> So I heard so many of these, I, it was pointless arguing, because people weren't interested in the actual facts. They just wanted to score points, in, 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 and this happened in the forum of the media. Um, 
And one of the people who raised these objections was Richard Wiseman, a previous holder of this post. And so I invited him to do his own experiments with this dog, which he did. He did three tests with his colleague, uh, Matthew Smith. These are the results of his three tests with the same dog in the same location. <laughs> As you see, they parallel uh, my own results very closely. Um, but that's not how, not how he saw it. He announced to the waiting world uh, that he'd refuted this dog's abilities because it had been to the window before the owner had set off to come home and therefore given a false alarm, and all the rest of the data could therefore be discarded um, since it had failed the test. Now, he now admits that these data are virtually identical to my own. Um, but the, the power of the sceptical, people want to hear a sceptical message in the serious media. Um, and a lot of science journalists amplify that message, um, and they're not too concerned with the facts. These are the facts. And I, what they show is that this has actually been independently replicated. Now, there have been other tests of dogs uh, with other dogs and so on, and I think this is now a fairly well-established fact that dogs really do know when their owners are coming home, or at least some of them do, not all. Um, and in some cases, they do it at non-routine times. Uh, the advantage of this compared with many parapsychology experiments, which are often quite boring, um, is that dogs never get bored with their owners coming home. They do it over and over again. Um, this, the most reliable of dogs I found, JT, did, does it, uh, uh, did it about 85% of the time. There were occasions he didn't respond. Most of those turned out to be when there was a bitch on heat in the next flat, um, showing that JT could be distracted. Um, the most extraordinary case of all that I've come across is a telepathic parrot called Enkisi. Now, I was going to show you a video of the parrot doing some uh, extraordinary tests. This is the parrot with the largest vocabulary in the world, currently 1,500 words. The Guinness Book of Records is 800 words. Um, and this parrot um, picks up his owner's thoughts and intentions and actually says them. People often say of dogs and cats, if only they could speak. Well, here's a parrot that can and, and does. Um, and we set up tests where we had sealed envelopes containing photographs uh, of corresponding to objects the, uh, the parrot knows the name for. Um, and the owner, Aimé, sat in a room on camera, opened a package, looked at the picture for two minutes. The parrot in another room, uh, completely isolated from her, um, filmed continuously, uh, was, uh, were, spoke. And we later had the tapes transcribed independently by three different independent transcribers. Uh, the words analyzed, and it turned out the parrot did indeed say what she was looking at, way above what you'd expect by chance. Uh, if we'd been able to show the video, unfortunately, no one knows how to operate it, so we can't. But um, the, um, the you'd see, you would have seen, um, when she looks at a picture of flowers, the parrot says, that's a flower, that's a pick of flowers, they're little flowers. When she looks at a picture of someone on the phone, it says, what are you doing on the phone? And it makes phone dialing noises and said, that's a phone. Um, in another one um, where the people are hugging, it, it, it says, that's a hug, that's my hug, and, and talks about hugs. It's quite extraordinary. It speaks in sentences. That alone is extraordinary. This bird is two generations away from the wild. It's an African grey. Um, and in terms of evolutionary bonds, uh, humans have had tens of thousands of years to evolve with dogs, but parrots... Most parrots that people keep are either wild caught or only one or two generations into captivity. And they can not only speak, but um, use language meaningfully, as Irene Pepperberg showed with her famous parrot, Alex, um, and pick up people's thoughts and utter them in English words. It's a co totally astonishing phenomenon. If you're interested, the details are published. Uh, I published all these uh, in, in, in technical papers and journals. And uh, they're summarized in, in my books. The main work on animals is summarized in this book, Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home and Other Unexplained Powers of Animals. Um, well, these uh, experiments with animals showed that telepathy uh, seems to occur quite widely in the animal kingdom. There are many other ways in which pet owners, dog trainers, blind people with guide dogs, police dog handlers, horse trainers, told me that their animals picked up thoughts or intentions, usually to do with things that affect the animal themselves. They know when people are going away, they know when they're coming back. 
Um, they know um, when they, people are planning, the dogs often know when people are planning to take them for an otherwise non-routine walk, even if they're in another room. Uh, blind people with guide dogs often find that the dog picks up their intention and takes them where they want to go without them actually having said anything about it. There, of course, they are, there is a physical contact through the harness, so there could be subtle cues. But uh, there's a huge field of research here, virtually unexplored. This is virgin scientific territory. It's remarkable that in the early 21st century, there's a vast field of science, both with domestic and wild animals, that's virtually unexplored. The reason it's unexplored is because it's a taboo, uh, that people within the scientific world have not felt free to explore this area, um, and still don't. Um, yet, there could be dozens of really fascinating PhD projects in, in this area, and we'd find out a great deal more about the way animal behavior is coordinated in the wild. Now, I came to work on human telepathy only after I'd done a lot of research with animals. And I tried to approach it in the same spirit by looking, first of all, at the natural history of the phenomenon. Of course, parapsychologists have worked <coughs> on telepathy um, ever since the founding of the Society for Psychical Research. But they've usually used very artificial tests to start with car card guessing experiments, which gave significant positive results if you do a meta-analysis of all the experiments. Something was going on. But it was a fairly small, uh, weak effect, but with thousands, hundreds of thousands of trials statistically significant. Dream telepathy experiments uh, were very successful in the 60s um, when people were doing that research, showing people could pick up images and dreams that someone else was looking at. The most recent uh, research is the Gansfeld telepathy tests, where subjects lie in a, a, a reclining chair with halved ping pong balls over their eyes in dim red light with white noise through earphones, a, a state of mild sensory deprivation, and uh, uh, able to pick up successfully images that other people are looking at in another soundproofed room, uh, uh, way above chance. Um, they d haven't all worked, but most have, and all the uh, recent meta-analyses show significant positive effects. But this is rather an artificial situation. <coughs> Not many people in real life uh, sit in reclining chairs in dim red light with ping pong balls over their eyes. And I was more interested to see what might have evolved in, under conditions of natural selection uh, with humans before the invention of telephones. Before telephones, the only way people could communicate at a distance would have been telepathy. If it exists, it would have been probably quite useful to know other people's needs and uh, uh, especially their needs when they're at a distance. One of the categories uh, of behavior I heard about from many people, were from women, uh, was um, about mothers who feel they could pick up telepathically when their baby needed them. Many nursing mothers have had the experience of going back to work or starting to leave the baby when the, it's th three or four months old. Um, and when they're away from the baby, feeling their milk let down. Now, the milk let down reflex is an oxytocin-mediated reflex that uh, causes the breasts to ex start expressing milk, the nipples leak. Uh, it's normally caused by the baby crying, and uh, mothers feel it, uh, it, it gets the breast ready to feed the baby. Um, it's a well-known physiological response. Um, and when mothers felt their milk letting down, often through feeling their breasts tingle, when they were away from the baby, most mothers just assumed their baby needed them. And until recently, they simply went home. Now they ring home on a mobile phone. Um, and they're usually right. Um, I did a study with 20 nursing mothers over a two-month period in North London, uh, where we monitored uh, the mothers every time they were out uh, away from the baby and monitored the baby. And we found the milk letdowns were synchronized with the baby's need uh, in an extraordinarily significant way, odds against chance of a billion to one. And it wasn't just routine times. We could control for that because we know, knew when all these things were happening. So here again is a huge potential area for research completely untouched, virgin territory. Uh, no one has uh, looked at it. It would be a great PhD project for someone doing, working in, uh, as a, for a midwife, for example, or people who work with nursing mothers. Um, so, uh, and there again, you can see that if, it, if this is indeed true, as I think it is, uh, then it would be useful. The mothers who had uh, 
mothers who's, who could tell when their baby needed them, when they were at a distance from the baby, would tend to have babies that survived better than mothers that couldn't tell. There'd be selective pressures in favor of this ability. It would play a useful role. And many mothers go on being uh, with a bond to their children, even when they've grown up. Uh, there are, I have many cases on my database of mothers who say they knew when their son or daughter was in distress or had had an accident, they just rang up because they just felt something was wrong. These bonds continue throughout many people's lives. And uh, there are dozens of examples of this, uh, of really dramatic examples of mothers knowing when they're needed. One of the things that this survey of natural history showed was that by far the commonest kind of telepathy in the modern world, or apparent telepathy, occurs in connection with telephone calls. Uh, it turns out that more than 80% of people have had the experience of thinking of someone for no apparent reason uh, who then rings. And when that person rings, they say, oh, that's funny, I was just thinking about you. Um, we've done surveys in um, a variety of countries about this. Um, and on average, uh, on the left, you see the uh, responses about telephone telepathy. On the right, uh, other kinds of telepathy. Telephone telepathy is much commoner than any other kind. Um, and it shows that telepathy has evolved along with modern technology. Uh, when people intend to call somebody, uh, which is a pretty basic human thing, you want somebody, you want to call them, um, uh, of course the intention precedes the phone call. You have to intend to call them before you make the call, and I think that's why people pick up this intention uh, before the call actually happens in many cases. Um, uh, women uh, report this experience much more than men. Well, even men it's over 70% compared with more than 95% of women. There were national differences uh, in our survey between men in this response. The most sensitive were in Argentina and the least sensitive in Britain. Um, <laughs> so uh, here's a well-known phenomenon, and I'd be pretty sure that most people in this room would have experienced it. Um, so here's a very common phenomenon. What does science have to tell us about it? Well, the answer is, until recently, absolutely nothing. Um, every scientist I discussed it with came up with the identical sceptical argument. Everyone in this room has probably been schooled in scepticism. All educated people are supposed to, in public at least, pretend they don't believe in telepathy because otherwise you lose your credibility as an educated person. In private, many people believe in it, talk about it to their friends and family. But in public, uh, almost... Uh, everybody feels the need to say, well, how do you know it's really telepathy? Surely you think about people all the time, and if one of them then rings up, you might think it's telepathy, but you forget the millions of times you're wrong. Uh, so it's just coincidence and selective memory. Or else they say, well, if you know someone well, you have an unconscious expectation of when they're going to ring, and that's why you know. The trouble with unconscious expectations is that uh, they're not necessarily an alternative to telepathy, to telepathy. They could be just another way of talking about it. Um, anyway, this kind of abstract theoretical argument gets one nowhere. And um, what I found was that the skeptics who so confidently put forward these arguments to me, uh, when I said, well, where's your evidence? You know, where are the studies on how often people think of other people? Uh, how, you know, how selective is their memory? They had no evidence at all. There'd been no studies of any kind on the subject. So it was an evidence-free hypothesis. Now, in science, it's fine to have a hypothesis, but you need evidence as well. And so I decided to test that hypothesis by finding ways of doing experiments where you could actually evaluate the chance coincidence theory and see whether this happened more than chance coincidence. The basic experiment involves uh, uh, finding people who say this happens to them, and then they give me the names and phone numbers of four friends, uh, people they know well, or family members. They sit at home uh, with a landline telephone, no caller ID system, being filmed on videotape. We then pick one of the four callers at random uh, by the throw of a die or with a random number table and ring them up and ask them to ring the subject. Th within two minutes, they do so. Um, so the subject's sitting there, the phone rings, and they have to guess who it is before they pick it up. So they say, the, it rings, they think, I think it's John, they pick it up, hello, John. They're right or they're wrong a one in four chance of being right by pure guesswork, 25%. Well, in these experiments, it turns out the hit rate 
is considerably higher than that. These are from more than 400 filmed telephone uh, telepathy tests. Um, the chance level is on the left, um, 25%. The actual hit rate was 45%. This was a highly significant. P is 1 times 10 to the minus 12. It's a highly significant uh, result. Um, we then tested, uh, uh, did some further tests where two of the callers were familiar people, the other two were strangers who the people had never met. And what we found there was on the left with the two unfamiliar people, uh, the, chance, the hit rate was only just above chance. With the familiar people, it was more than twice the chance level, 52%, uh, showing that uh, telepathy occurs much more between people who are bonded, uh, who have bonds, emotional or social bonds with each other than strangers. Unfortunately, many parapsychology experiments have involved getting total strangers into the laboratory and testing them on card guessing and Gansfeld experiments. When they have had people who know each other well, the experiment, the data, uh, the results are much stronger. The effect is much bigger. The, um, this is a summary of some of the features of this kind of telepathy. It's been replicated at Amsterdam and Freiburg universities. Uh, it doesn't depend on distance. We've done experiments up to and including Australia and New Zealand. Uh, with young Australians and New Zealanders we recruited from the Earl's Court area of London. Um, and two of their callers were f new acquaintances in Britain. The other two uh, were family members or girlfriends or boyfriends down under. Uh, and they actually did better with the uh, people down under than with their new acquaintances, showing that what matters is emotional closeness, not physical proximity. Of course, with telephone telepathy, you can do experiments over any distance you like, up to the antipodes. Now, um, very similar things occur with emails. Uh, exactly the same kind of phenomenon uh, is reported by many people with emails. They think of someone and then they get an email from them. It's one of the ways in which this ability to pick up people's intentions is evolving along with technology. Telephones came first, emails are much later. Uh, but we did very similar experiments with emails. People had four emailers. They had to guess who was sending them an email out of these four people at, say, 12 o'clock. And uh, at 12 o'clock, the person was writing them that email, and they didn't send it till 12.01 after we'd received the guess. And um, the beauty of emails is the time is actually printed into the email. The technology gives you the exact time to the second. So you can be sure the guess was made before the email was received. We filmed people doing these to make sure they weren't cheating with phone calls or instant messages. Um, and the results of the emailed uh, tests shows, again, the 25% chance level um, is on the left. The actual hit rate was 47%. Um, again, a highly significant ex uh, result. We did more than 200 of these tests. Um, again, we compared familiar and unfamiliar callers with very similar results to the telephone experiment. And um, I've developed, uh, two or three years ago, an automated email telepathy <coughs> test where the whole procedure was automated. People entered the names. The computer did the uh, picking of the people at random, sending them the messages, and coordinated the whole test. We did it with three senders, not four. So the hit rate by chance is 33% on the left. Uh, the actual hit rate is 42%. Um, and uh, again, it's a significant, quite significant result. Um, so this works with uh, emails. It works with telephone calls. I tried to develop a really rapid telepathy test that would be automatic, that worked on the internet. And um, for that test, um, people had to have four people online at the same time. One of the four would then get a message uh, to write a message to the subject. Um, they'd ha the subject would have a minute to think about who was writing it. They'd have to guess, then they get the message. Um, that gave... Uh, statistically uh, significant results as well. There's on the left, the auto test on the left is this internet-based test. Um, and it worked reasonably well. Uh, then I thought I'd try speeding it up to 30 seconds and 12 trials, 30 seconds each. My idea was to try and get a method that would work with instant telepathy testing that could be done using new technologies. Uh, that didn't work as well. The results were still significant, but um, it was much uh, it was a, a smaller effect. 
And uh, by comparison, you see the email and telephone telepathy experiments on the right, uh, which showed much stronger effects. Now, why did this instant uh, uh, email, uh, internet-based test not work very well? I think one reason was that it was too fast, um, that people simply didn't have time to recover from one guess. Uh, uh, and the other thing is that the four senders all had to be at their computers uh, thinking about the person uh, uh, all the time because they had to wait and see if they got a signal to send a message. That meant that instead of detaching themselves from the subject, they couldn't avoid thinking about the subject to some extent because they were, after, after all, doing an experiment. So if all four were sort of connected to the subject, this would create a high noise level, which would make the signal harder to detect. The beauty of the telephone and email tests is that between the experiments, which were paced at least 10 minutes apart, um, people um, didn't... Uh, have to uh, do anything to do with the experiment. They get on with their lives, do something else. I then set up automated tests that work on text messages and telepathy um, on, on mobile telephones. Um, the SMS test uh, showed uh, a, a significant positive effect. These were the three senders, so the chance level is 33%. That's 37.9%. With the telephone automated telephone test, it's 42%, and high, very significantly above the chance level. Um, these tests make telepathy very easy to do for anybody. You log on through my website, you put in the names and mobile phone numbers of three friends, and the test uh, works by the computer picking one of the three at random, sends them a text message asking them to ring you at a landline number, which is the computer. They ring you, they're put on hold. The computer then rings you. So if you're the subject, your phone rings, the caller ID says telepathy test. Uh, you answer it, it says, hello, this is the telepathy test. One of your three callers is on the line right now waiting to speak to you. Please guess who it is by pressing one, two, or three, which you do. Uh, and then as soon as you've guessed, the line opens up and you get instant feedback. Uh, you can hear whether they... Um, where you know whether you're right or not. Uh, then, after talking for a minute, it cuts off because I'm paying for the call. Um, <laughs> and after a random time delay, it does the same thing again. Well, this automated test has been working uh, very well, uh, as you see here. And um, this is with unselected participants. I mean, with our earlier tests, we select people who said it happened to them in real life. A lot of people who are doing this are people who've never actually experienced it in real life, or at least some of them, or who experience it only frequently, infrequently. So this is um, a, a very simple to do test. Anyone can do it anywhere, and it gets telepathy research out of the laboratory. Um, I now have, um, oh, let me just say one thing. This is a point raised, and, and very rightly so, by Horace Barlow, who is the chairman of the Perrot Warwick Committee, um, that the, in these telephone tests, if some of the people are slow in responding, if there's a delay of an hour or two, and you know that one of your three friends is at a lecture or at an important meeting, you could work out who it was just from that delay. That didn't apply to our earlier tests, the telephone tests, because people did them right when they were asked to. There was no delay. Um, and indeed, in some of these tests, there was a delay. But what we did looked at the subset of experiments, of trials at the lower thing, where the, every single one of the six trials in the test, these, these tests have six trials in them, uh, uh, happened in less than 12 minutes, which is the time, the random time delay was up to 10 minutes, and it takes about two minutes for the system to operate. So this is the minimum time they could happen in. So you couldn't get any information from this delay because there were random delays between three minutes and 12 minutes uh, in these experiments. And uh, the, indeed, um, the hit rate is somewhat lower, uh, but it's still immensely significant statistically. Now, one of the questions that parapsychologists ask, most people don't, but parapsychologists do, is how do you know it's really telepathy? Because precognition is another form of psychic act activity that I think there's good evidence it can happen. And if precogn it could be that you precognize who you're going to speak to, that you know in advance who you're going to speak to, rather than picking up their intention telepathically. Well, I created a, a, 
a modified version of the telephone telepathy test where you had to guess who was going to call you before the computer had selected the caller and before they'd made the call. There's no way you could have known. Uh, uh, so if, they got, if people had got it right, about chance it would have been a precognition result, not a telepathy result. In fact, somewhat to my surprise, the precognition results came out exactly at the chance level uh, compared with the telepathy test very significantly above it. So it does seem that at least in these conditions we're looking at a telepathy effect rather than a precognition effect. Now, <coughs> um, one thing I should say is that the, the, I have a new version of the telephone telepathy test with just two callers. It makes it easier to do with just two people involved rather than three. This was launched last week. And I invite you to try it for yourselves. If you go to my website um, and uh, go to the online experiments portal, um, you can register for this, put in two friends or family members' names and phone numbers, and the test will proceed automatically, and you'll do six trials. With two callers, you do uh, the hit rate by chance is obviously around three, 50%. Um, and I've also launched in the last two weeks a, a different version of this test in the United States. Until now, it's only been available in Britain. Uh, the American version works on a new state-of-the-art computer serving system called Twilio. It's a cloud computing system. So if any of you have friends in America, they can now do it too. Um, this research has aroused a great deal of interest in the world of new media. I gave a seminar on this research at the request of the Google Technical Group uh, a couple of years ago, and my Google Technical Seminar is online on the Google website. Um, and many people in Silicon Valley and also in phone companies like Nokia have got very interested in this because they think it should be possible to develop apps, applications, <coughs> that do these kinds of tests. Uh, if that were the case, if they were standard features, that you, options that you could in, uh, install on mobile telephones, the number of people doing these tests could rise to the millions. It could generate data on an unprecedented level. Um, it would also enable people to train their intuition. The, how they're thinking of marketing it is as intuition training apps. Because <coughs> if you know when you're right and when you're wrong, as you do with these tests, uh, you could then uh, practice so that you got better at doing it that could then lead to, uh, inter uh, to national competitions for the most telepathic person in Britain. Uh, I've had TV companies approach me uh, wanting to do this. Um, and the next level would be the International Telepathy Olympics. Um, uh, now, if that occurred with telepathy on mobile phones um, and uh, international contests and that kind of thing, the question of does it exist or not would become a non-question. Um, I have to say that most skeptics, there are some very reasonable skeptics and well-informed skeptics. One of them is Chris French, who's also been supported by the Perrot Warwick Fund. Uh, but some of them are not very well-informed. Um, during the controversy in the Times and elsewhere that occurred after the British Association meeting that Bernard Carr referred to at the beginning uh, uh, of this gathering, um, I was denounced by Professor Peter Atkins, who's a leading uh, skeptic at Oxford, a chemist, um, uh, saying that the British Association should never have allowed anyone to talk about this pseudo-scientific topic. Um, and then I was put, uh, asked to take part in an interview with him on BBC Radio 5. Um, he said in the Times, uh, as you see at the top, no reason to suppose that to left is anything other than a charlatan's fantasy. In the discussion on Radio 5, I said to him, Professor Atkins, have you actually looked at the evidence? He said, no, of course not. Um, I, I said, why, why not? He said, well, if I did, he said, I'd be very, very suspicious of it. And I said, there's a word for that. It's called prejudice. Um, and uh, <laughs> and um, he simply didn't know. He was prepared to stand up in public to the entire nation and announce that it was a fantasy, that there was nothing in, in complete ignorance. Now, how is that possible? Not, not one of us could stand up and denounce modern research in quantum physics or radio astronomy I, I, with complete absence of any information at all. But when it comes to telepathy, a surprisingly large number of otherwise intelligent people feel that they have the right to pronounce in a state of ignorance. Professor Lewis Walpert, um, 
appeared denouncing my research on a TV show, the people asked him in advance if he'd like to see the tapes of the experiments before he commented on them. He said, no, absolutely no need, and then said what you read there. There's no evidence for any person, animal, or thing being telepathic. Um, I challenged him to a public debate at the Royal Society of Arts, which happened a few years ago with a judge in the chair. It was written up in Nature, and it was perfectly clear he knew nothing of the evidence, and he didn't want to know it either, because in the lecture, uh, while I was showing the evidence on the screen, he sat at a table tapping a pencil, looking bored, staring into the distance, and didn't turn around to look at the evidence behind him. And uh, Professor Richard Dawkins, who until recently was Professor of Public Understanding of Science, came to interview me for his recent TV series called Enemies of Reason, um, <laughs> a sequel to his program on religion called The Root of All Evil. Um, <laughs> and um, I made it a condition of seeing him for this program that it was a discussion about evidence. I said I wasn't interested in taking part in another of his low-grade debunking programs. So um, they said, yes, it was about evidence. It would be completely fair. He was really interested in hearing the evidence and so forth. So I agreed to it. He came to see me. And when he arrived, uh, after a, a bit of preliminary banter <coughs> and him saying how this was just wishful thinking, I said, well, look, we've met to discuss the evidence. Why don't we do that? He said, I don't want to discuss the evidence. And I said, why not? He said, it's too hard. It's too difficult. I said, most people can understand it. Uh, he said, we haven't time. I said, it only takes a few minutes. He said, anyway, it's not what this program is about. And I said, oh, really? I said, I thought I'd made it clear I didn't want to take part in another low-grade debunking program. It's not a low-grade debunking program. It's a high-grade debunking program. <laughs> <laughs> the director then said, cut. And I asked him if it was true. He said, yes, it was another Dawkins polemic. He didn't tell me when they asked me to take part that I was going to be portrayed as an enemy of reason for doing research in this field. But it is extraordinary, the passions that this subject can arouse in the minds of people who claim to be on the side of science, reason, and evidence. Um, I'm sure everybody in this room has encountered skeptics of that kind. Um, I think one of the reasons for the fear, as I said at the beginning, is that if telepathy exists, it would lead to an overthrow of science as we know it, turn the laws of nature upside down, and so forth. I don't think it would. The development of Max uh, Faraday's work on electromagnetism and Maxwell's equations didn't destroy the whole of Newtonian physics. It added to it. Um, and I think that admitting uh, the existence of telepathy as a natural feature of animal communication would enlarge our view of animal nature and human nature. Consciousness studies is one of the most exciting areas of science at the moment. And um, within consciousness studies, there's no agreed model of the nature of the mind. It's, by philosophers of mind, it's called the hard problem. No one knows how consciousness relates to the brain or the mind. It's not as if we have a certain totally correct understanding of the nature of minds uh, with predictions to seven places in decimals. It's not like that. We don't understand how the mind works. I think if we uh, take on board these phenomena, um, then I think it would lead to an enhanced understanding of the mind, and, uh, which is exactly what Frederick Myers thought when he started his research on telepathy uh, here in Trinity. The final point I'd like to make is this. All around the world, telepathic phenomena and other psychic phenomena like premonitions are taken for granted in traditional societies. Um, for example, Sir Lawrence van der Post, uh, when he was living with the Bushmen of the Kalahari, um, told the story of how, when they went out hunting, um, the bushmen he was with were convinced that the people back in the village would know when they'd shot a deer. Um, and he says, as we were heading back in Land Rovers laden with meat, uh, I asked one of the bushmen how the people would react when they learned of our success. He replied, they already know. They know by wire. We bushmen have a wire here, tapping his chest, that brings us news. He was comparing their means of communication with the white man's telegram or wire. Sure enough, when we approached the camp, the people were singing the Eland song and preparing to give the hunters the greatest of welcomes. This kind of story from people who've lived in Africa is very common. When I lived in India, I found that most people completely take these phenomena for granted. In traditional societies, 
uh, they're extremely well known and used and developed and cultivated. Unfortunately, um, I think that many anthropologists who are the people who study these societies have gone into the field with the mindset that these things are impossible and have not studied what actually would have been some of the most fascinating things to observe and, and look at. So I think one of the things we can do is we, um, if we admit that this is a normal, natural kind of phenomenon, is to look at its incidence in other societies, which hasn't been done. Almost all uh, telepathic research has been done in European and Ameri uh, countries and in America. Um, so I think that this is a field of research that is just at the beginning. It's extraordinary. In the 21st century, as I said, uh, we have a field uh, of inquiry that's hardly explored. It's hardly been explored because of the power of the taboos that have restrained exploration in this area. But I think if we just forget about those taboos and treat this as a rational scientific inquiry into natural phenomena, I think science will benefit. It will become much more powerful if science investigates these phenomena than if scientists feel they have to pretend they don't exist and deny them in the face of evidence that most people know uh, is real. And it gives scientists an image of being prejudiced and dogmatic and even fanatical. Um, um, I just think it would be better for science and better for our understanding of nature uh, if we can approach these things in a rational spirit of inquiry. <coughs> And I'd like to end by saying I feel very grateful to Trinity College and to the Parrot Warwick Bequest for enabling me to do research in this area for five years, which I think is, um, as the re request bequest was intended, um, is something that uh, can help and continue to help uh, the legacy uh, that Myers founded uh, while he was here at Trinity. Thank you. So I'm now going to open the floor up for, for questions. Yes, gentlemen. Thank you, yes. I wonder, are you, in your talk, you talked about uh, people who didn't want to look at the evidence. And, but have you had uh, experiences of people who started off skeptical, but then were willing to look at the evidence, and then changed their mind in conversation with you? Or what's been your, your experience? Well, there are certainly the point is, it depends what kind of skeptic. There's a huge, there's the kind of conventional skeptic, like I was myself, people who just mouth these skeptical opinions and believe them because it's part of their scientific conditioning. Um, there are other people who feel very, very strongly about it and belong to skeptical organizations. There are quite a lot of sort of self-appointed vigilante groups, um, like the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal in America. And uh, the skeptic magazines in America have about 100,000 subscribers. The total number of active researchers in parapsychology in America is about 10. So you can see they're enormously outnumbered by these highly motivated skeptics. They're usually militant atheists, and they feel that their whole world view would be threatened by the existence of psychic phenomena. Now, most people who are not part of those organizations. I, I, I think most people, most people in the world of science don't have those extreme views and are indeed open to evidence. I've often given talks in scientific institutions and university departments, and I find that um, uh, the majority of people are actually open to it, largely because they've experienced it themselves. A lot of scientists have dogs waiting for them at the door when they get home from the lab, and many have had the experience with telephone calls. So for people like that, the evidence is of interest, and I think they're the majority. Um, um, so it's only the extreme skeptics who I think will never change their minds. I think most scientists are trained in a skeptical attitude. It's part of science. I mean, I have it myself. All, all peer review process involves skepticism in every branch of science. It's, it's only this dogmatic form of skepticism that, that's evidence-free that's a big problem. But people who believe that are often very vociferous. But you've had experiences then of people say who don't have pets. You know, they don't have any personal connection, but just looking at the evidence, they started off skeptical, but the evidence itself was enough to change their mind? Well, I don't know how many people have fill it, fit into that category. Probably not very many. And when it comes to an issue like this, most people's opinions are based largely on their own experience or the experience of people they know. If they think these phenomena are real, it's largely on the basis of personal experience. The evidence then helps to give them permission, as it were, to take their experience seriously. Um, because normally they don't feel they have that permission. 
I gave a talk in a department of animal behavior, um, not a thousand miles from here, um, and uh, th there were six key members of staff at the talk. And afterwards, everywhere in the tea break, all six came up and said, you know, I'm really interested in these things. I think they really happen. I think this evidence is very persuasive, but I can't discuss it with my colleagues because they're all so straight. When all six, including the professor, had said the same thing to me, I said, you know, why don't you guys come out? You'd have so much more fun. <laughs> um, uh, um, so um, there's a very big difference between what people in the scientific world say in public and what they think in private. And the openness to the evidence is actually quite great, and I think a lot of scientists would be very pleased if these were permitted subjects of research within scientific institutions, as they are indeed in several British universities, and indeed uh, right here in Trinity College, which is one of the, uh, the Perrot Warwick Fund here is one of the biggest funds for this research in Britain, if not in the world. Um, so this is in fact a key centre for this, and Trinity was one of the key places where the Society for Psychical Research began from. Gentlemen at the back, you seem to skip over the precognition element of many of these things, which could probably cover so many phenomena that come under the parapsychology yes. area. If there was a basic competence of precognition and telepathy, there are various phenomena, events in life which would have proved one or the other. And the one that occurred to me while you were talking, which would have proved overwhelmingly telepathy, Abhavan. You're an age to remember that. One would have expected a wall of telepathic communication, which anecdotally would have been proved. If it was just precognition, it would just mesh into the general wall of life. Well, I think precognition does occur. And um, I've, I've made a study of it, particularly in animals. In, in my book, Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home, I have a lot of, I've been doing research on animal warnings of earthquakes and tsunamis for the last 20 years. There's a lot of evidence for premonition in animals and in people, and, uh, and for precognition. In the case of Abba Fan, uh, there were, in fact, quite a few people who had precognitive dreams of this disaster before it happened. So I'm not saying precognition doesn't happen. Uh, I didn't talk about it this evening because I was specifically talking on the theme of telepathy, and it would have been hard to fit in precognition as well. If you know, if I gave another Parrot Warwick lecture, I'd talk on precognition because it's telepathic storm about the event, though, wasn't there? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I think there probably was. I mean, a lot of people, but of course, it's hard to separate that from news coverage because. Once disasters happen in the modern world, it's instantly on radio and television. So it's hard to separate information people have, would have got telepathically without all the regular news. Um, so it would only, you'd only be able to test the telepathic. But the other thing is telepathy works between people who know each other well. And relatives of people in Aberfan might have known, but people who nev who'd never been to Aberfan or knew nobody there, you wouldn't expect them to respond to it particularly. Um, this gentleman there. No, no, the one behind and then you. I was just curious if you have done any experiments or if anyone else has done experiments with twins. Because I'm a twin and I certainly had moments when I knew my twin sister was in trouble and that's one of the first questions I'm asked when I say I'm a twin, hmm. is if I have that kind of telepathic connection. Yes. Well, um, I personally haven't, partly because it's rather hard to collect enough monozygotic twins. I mean... To, to do the experiments. Um, one of my colleagues in the Society for Psychical Research, Guy Lyon Playfair, has written a whole book on twin telepathy. And he's now um, linked up with the St. Thomas's Hospital Twin Research Unit. And they're hoping to do some serious research on this. One of the problems has been that the people who hold the twin databases are mostly medical organizations. And if you go to anyone like that and you say, I would like to work with you doing telepathy <coughs> research on twin, twins, the doors clang shut straight away. Um, so again, you see, these prejudices are not really in favor of science. They inhibit research. If, if they were really about evidence, I'd, I'd be more... But again, that's one of the fields of inquiry that frustratingly hasn't been followed up as much as it could, although Guy's preliminary surveys show lots of examples. And of course, it's a matter of popular knowledge, too. Uh, Ruben, can I just interject that one of the... Uh PhD student who's currently being funded by Parrot Warwick is in fact doing the first precisely in the area of twin research, it's not yet been published. Um, 
first view than normal. Thank you for that talk. Um, is there people that are prone and geared to have telepathic experiences more than others? And that's my first and second question. Can you train to become more telepathic than me? Well, both good questions. Um, certainly on the basis of surveys and reports, the best way to be telepathic is to be female. Uh, women are much better at this than men on the whole, in accordance with the popular idea that women are more intuitive. Um, now, th there's certainly big differences between people. In my tests, um, I find some people score consistently highly, um, and other people don't score very well at all. Um, so, like any human ability, the sense of smell, the ability to do mathematics, you know, there are uh, differences, and you'd expect there to be a difference in the population. Among dogs and cats, there are some that are much more sensitive than others. About 50% seem to respond to homecomings, but 50% don't. So, um, yes, there are certainly individual differences. The question is whether you can train this is something I'd very much like to know the answer to myself, because uh, for the point of view of this research, it would be really good to have people who can be trained and who can score consistently well. The very big problem with all telepathy tests is that when you ask people to do these randomized statistical tests, you set up conditions that actually inhibit the very phenomenon you're studying. These things work best unconsciously without people thinking about them. They're not part of our higher rational faculty at all. Um, they work in animals, they work physiologically, uh, in nursing mothers and so on. Um, and as soon as you have to think about it in these artificial situations, I think it inhibits the phenomenon that one's studying. Now, training people, there are intuition trainers who give workshops on the subject, and I've been trying to persuade them to test their participants with my tests before and after the intuition training uh, workshops and see whether their scores go up. Uh, they, most of them have been rather reluctant to do that. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but now I have a test that works in America. I did find some gung-ho American intu intuition trainers, but I didn't have an easily doable test until last week. And now I'm, I'm going to reopen that as a possibility. Um, Donald West, a, a former member of the Parrot Warrior Committee, next. I think that uh, a resonance between minds doesn't seem to be altogether beyond the conception of many people. On the other hand, um, J.B. Ryan, who did a lot of ESP tests and telepathy, extended it to seeing whether you could, by uh, conscious will, affect the form of dice. And much more recently, of course, there's been a lot of work on people trying to affect by consciousness the um, output of random number generators. Now, this seems to be a, a totally different order of phenomena. I wonder what you think about it. Psychokinetic phenomena. Yeah. I haven't done much research on psychokinesis, and so I don't have any particularly strong views. But for me, um, the, I mean, the most dramatic cases are the spontaneous cases like poltergeist cases, where heavy objects fly around. And of course, those are hard to investigate. You can't do them in the laboratory. But various psychical researchers, as you know, have looked into them over the years. I think they seem to some of them are real, in my opinion. Um, the Random event, event generators, unfortunately, give rather weak effects. I think they do give effects, but they're very weak. For me, by far the most interesting random event psychokinetic experiments are those of René Payoc, the French uh, investigator, who had a little robot that moved randomly. It moved through random angles and for random times. And he got day-old chicks imprinted on it, so they thought it was their mother. They followed it round. They desperately wanted to be near it. It's a easy form of learning in day-old chicks. He then put the chicks in cages, and the robot was moving around. They couldn't get close to the robot, but what happened was they made the robot come close to them, and much more than chance it was near to the chicks who, who wanted to be near it, whereas chicks that weren't imprinted on robots were frightened of them, and in that case, the robot went further away, uh, more than chance in the opposite direction. To me, that's by far the most interesting starting point, and because it works with animals, um, I, I think it would give stronger and more repeatable results than people just trying to influence some uh, meter reading by the mind, which doesn't have any importance for them. For the chicks, it's desperately important to be near what they think is their mother, and they've been tricked into thinking this robot's their mother, and they're highly motivated. So 
if I were, did do research in psychokinesis, I'd start with, I'd start by trying to replicate Payox experiments with chicks and robots. Now we are beginning to run out of time. Um, Brian, no, okay. just want to say since uh, various people have brought the question up, that there is an iPhone app called, I think it's called ESP Trainer, which was devised by uh, Russell Tarr, a well-known uh, experimenter in the field. Um, I don't think he collects the data now. No. Well, it would be good to come, now, now my test runs in America, which is where most people who do his thing are. It would be good for people to take the test, do his training thing, and then take the test again and see if their scores go up. Um, I'm going to have to be, well, I'm going to let you have a question, and then the person over there, and then we must finish. So, oh, uh, and I'm I'd like to know uh, if epilepsy is, a, is an oh. aspect of resonance tuning of the mind, how information overload and the pressure of numbers and uh, density of the people living together actually affects our telepathic abilities because a lot of true open telepathy exists in very much more uh, harmonic areas of the world, maybe in tribal life. But it seems to break down in cities, I think. Well, yes and no. I mean, I think that in traditional societies, as I said, I think it's probably much better developed and more widely used. In, in our society, we have means of communication like telephones that render it relatively unnecessary. Um, and also, we have a cultural context where the educated classes have been brought up to believe it doesn't exist and to deny it, um, or at least to treat it as somehow a suspect. Uh, so nobody's encouraged to develop their abilities in our society, or very few people. Um, nevertheless, um, to me, the most fascinating thing about these new technologies, mobile telephones, text messages, um, and so on, is that telepathy is probably happening more than ever before now because people spend spo so much time uh, communicating at a distance with telephones and through SMS messages. Um, so uh, I think that um, it's actually uh, on the increase in modern urban societies all over the world until the invention of the telephone, people didn't feel that, most people didn't feel they could communicate with someone at a distance, except perhaps by telepathy, and not everyone would have had the confidence they could do it. Now everyone has the confidence they can communicate at a distance. And telepathy goes along with the phenomenon. It's a kind of byproduct. The intention precedes the phone call, and people can pick it up. So I think it's going actually increasing, not decreasing at the moment. Now, actually, by a strange synchronicity, um, the two ladies who wanted to ask questions were in the same line of sight, so there was a misunderstanding. Thank you for your question, but the lady in front of you also had a question. Um, I'm quite intrigued whether any research has been done about uh, whether mothers know when they have conceived instantly. And um, I wondered if there's any possibility of finding out whether the telepathic bond occurs instantaneously or has to be built up over a relationship with something. I don't yes. know how many women are aware when they've conceived, but I was, for instance, once, mm. instantly. And so um, I just feel that this is, uh, is this telepathy or not? I don't know. It could be physiological, of course, because there are hormonal changes as well. Um, hard to separate. I mean, you couldn't in, in actually tease them apart. but. You know, I would, if I were doing research on that, I'd start by doing surveys and interview uh, surveys to find out how many women had had that experience, what it felt like, how often were they wrong ever. Um, and I'd start with the natural history. As in any of these fields of research, we have to start with natural history. And that would be a good place for, to start with natural history, and it would make a very good research project for someone interested in midwifery or nursing, for example. Oh. Thank you. Now we've just got two more questions, and the penultimate one is from the gentleman over at the right. I'm wondering, given certain advances that have been made in self-reproducing automata uh, and the potential implications of this uh, uh, for the relation between living and non-living organisms, if it's possible that a kind of feeling machine could be created that could pick up on certain morphic field resonance, kind of, I mean, if there's artificial intelligence, could there be artificial pathos that could verify these things like a computer? Well, that's an important question, because if, if there was any possibility of this, a whole new field of technology would open up. I discussed this in the new edition of my book, A New Science of Life, which came out two years ago, um, that 
the, the reason that how I think morphic fields work, I mean, it's a whole new topic, so I have to do it very briefly, is by imposing patterns on otherwise ind indeterminate or probabilistic events. Um, now, normally computers are highly probabilistic, and even if they have random event generators in them, they work on pseudo-random algorithms. So an ordinary computer, in, like most machinery, would have no way in which this could get a grip. However, if you have a computer with random quantum noise built into it, um, then there's a way that it could. And the best computers, I think, for having truly the possibility of, as it were, really an analog to living computers are actually analog computers, not digital computers. So I think that it might be possible to make morphically resonant analog computers that would influence each other at a distance, communicate at a distance, and have a global memory bank uh, without the need for satellites, telephone wires, and so forth. Uh, but that's obviously rather speculative, and no one's looked into that yet. But I think that could be one of the technologies of the future. And I'm going to um, ask Horace Barlow, the chairman of the Parrot Warwick Committee, for his comments. Only a couple of points to make. Uh, first of all, uh, I think anybody who has raised a point with Rupert uh, objecting to some of his tests will agree with, me, agree with me that he at least does pay attention to the evidence and uh, sometimes even incorporates it in his tests so that the, uh, um, uh, he's, he's, he doesn't behave like a typical skeptic, as you may have gathered. Um, <laughs> so th th that's the first point I want to make, and also to thank him for a very entertaining and, in, in parts, convincing. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you again. Mm. Well, thank you, Horace. Thank you, thank you for that remark, Horace. And uh, if I could just echo a point you said, um, I've had a lifelong interest in this subject, but most of my scientific colleagues and friends don't actually, uh, you know, believe in these phenomena, or at least they're not committed to it. And uh, but the key point that Horace has just made is that actually, in order to look at the evidence, it takes a huge amount of time. And I and I do not expect my scientific colleagues to actually be able necessarily to take the time to look at the evidence. The only thing which annoys me is when somebody hasn't looked at the evidence and proclaims that it's all nonsense. But uh, so I think that's an important point. But anyway. Um, I would like to thank you very much indeed, Rupert. Um, but finally, I just want to say thank you so much, uh, Rupert, for a most um, stimulating um, and uh, humorous, but also very scholarly talk. And uh, it's been fascinating to hear about the wide breadth of research you've been doing. And thank you all for coming here, because that also shows that you've also been uh, open-minded enough to come and listen to the evidence. So thank you very much, Rupert, and we wish you well in your future research in this area as well. So thank, thank you. you. I appreciate it. Thank you.